This is After the Fact, a podcast from the Pew Charitable Trusts, and I'm your host, Dan LaDuke. Our data point for this episode is a big one, $477 billion, that's dollars, and it's how much the United States spent on prescription drugs last year, according to the Department of Health and Human Services, and it's projected to grow. Republican Senator Susan Collins of Maine has been troubled by these rising costs and been looking for ways to give consumers more affordable choices at their local pharmacy. In 2017, bipartisan legislation she sponsored was signed into law and was a critical step toward leveling the playing field for less expensive generic drugs to better compete. This July, she spoke at Pew's Washington office about her efforts to stem the cost of prescription drugs and ensure Americans are able to buy the medications they need. She was introduced by Pew's Sue Yaran, and here's Sue. Good morning, everyone. I'm Sue Yaran. I am the Executive Vice President and Chief Program Officer here at Pew, where we have a diverse mix of initiatives ranging from health, state, consumer, and environmental policy initiatives to advancing biomedical and environmental research to support for our hometown of Philadelphia. Now, I know that July, um, the middle of July, is prime time for leaving D.C. for beautiful and perhaps cooler summer places like the coast of Maine. Um, So I am particularly pleased to welcome all of you here today and our very special guest, Senator Susan Collins from the great state of Maine. Now we're recording this event um, so that it can be presented on Pew's podcast called After the Fact, which will extend the reach of Senator Collins' remarks beyond this room and beyond today. Now, before I invite Senator Collins to the podium, I wanted to spend just a minute giving a brief overview of her extraordinary career and the bipartisan effort that she is leading to stop the escalating cost of prescription drugs. Senator Collins grew up in Caribou, Maine and graduated magna cum laude from St. Lawrence College. Within months of finishing college, she was working in the office of Senator William Cohen, also from Maine, a tenure that lasted 12 years and included working on the Government Affairs Subcommittee on the Oversight of Government Management. She also worked as the Commissioner of the Department of Professional and Financial Regulation under former Maine Governor John McKernan, Jr., and the Regional Director of the Small Business Administration for uh, President George H.W. Bush. In 1996, Senator Collins was elected to the U.S. Senate, um, and in the years since, she has never missed a roll call vote. That's more than 6,600 votes in a row. Now, the people of Maine clearly trust and admire Senator Collins, and so do her Senate colleagues. For the past four years, she was ranked the most bipartisan member of the Senate by the Luger Center at Georgetown University. Here at Pew, we talk a lot about the importance of public service, Senator Collins' unbroken record of constituent service and fulfilling her constitutional duties pretty much define that term. So today, Senator Collins is here to help us better understand her work to stem the out-of-control increases in prescription drug prices. She works closely with her colleagues in both parties, especially Senator Claire McCaskill of Missouri, to carefully study this issue and propose evidence-based solutions. Earlier this year, she introduced legislation to eliminate pharmacy gag rules that prevent patients from knowing the lowest possible cost for prescription drugs. And just last month, the Senate Judiciary Committee passed legislation co-sponsored by Senator Collins that will increase competition and increase the affordability of of prescription drugs for all Americans. Senator Collins is a leading voice, not only for fair drug prices and better health outcomes, but for comity, civility, and generosity. So now it's my great pleasure to introduce Senator Susan Collins. Thank you, Sue, and good morning to all of you. I'm delighted to be here to join in an important discussion, and I want to commend the Pew Charitable Trust for its extensive research work in so many areas, including your drug spending research initiative, which I'm very much looking forward to seeing the results of. I want to acknowledge Kevin Kelly of my staff, uh, who is the staff director of the Aging Committee, but actually worked here uh, for a while, a couple of years, in between stints in my office. And uh, so he knows well the terrific work that the Pew Charitable Trust does. I also understand that uh, we're either going to be joined by or have been joined by the Pew president, 
Uh, there she is. I see her, Rebecca Rimmel. I read all about you last night. It was really impressive. Your medical background that a, um, it, that you were able to convince physicians to allow you to be a professor of neuroscience uh, shows that, that not only uh, your extraordinary ability, but persuasiveness, too, I would say. <laughs> Uh, so thank you for making the effort to be with us today. Today, I'm going to discuss the work that I've been doing at the federal level to combat the rising cost of prescription drugs to ensure that patients have affordable access to the therapies that they need. With prescription drugs being identified in virtually every study, as one of the key cost drivers for healthcare, it is essential that we better understand the underlying causes of soaring prices so that we can develop and implement policies that both encourage innovation and the development of new drugs while protecting consumers from escalation that has no justification. The past century could well be called the age of miracle drugs, from insulin to penicillin to pharmaceuticals that treat cancer, HIV, heart disease, and so many serious health conditions. Modern drugs improve, extend, and even save lives. In our time, however, we might define a miracle drug as one that has not doubled in price since the last refill. <laughs> Over the weekend, the Wall Street Journal reported 3,653 price increases on a little more than 1,000 different drugs since the beginning of this year. Some of the price increases were modest. Others undoubtedly were justified. But in the case of a spray version of a common sleeping aid, the price soared from $69.88 to $659. And it is very difficult when you read this article, we haven't investigated the, the specifics yet, but to see any justification for that kind of price spike. The issue, after all, is about people. It's about patients who need required medications. It's about their family members and their friends and neighbors who are worried about their struggle to buy the medications that they need. This was brought home to me in a very real way recently when I was standing in line in the pharmacy in Bangor, Maine, where I live. And I was right behind a couple, and I wasn't meaning to eavesdrop, but their raised voices made it impossible for me not to hear their conversation with the pharmacist. Their copay was $111. And the husband turned to his wife and said, There is no way that we can afford this. And they just turned around and left the drug there. And I was so troubled by seeing that. Because obviously, this drug had been prescribed for them, so it was something that they needed, that one of them needed. So I queried the pharmacist about how often this happened. And imagine my dismay when his response was, it happens every day. So... The cost of these vital drugs is not just a theoretical concept or an interesting research project. It has a real impact on individuals, healthcare systems, and the federal government. 
Americans spend a staggering $328 billion on prescription drugs each year. The federal government picks up about $129 billion of that in payments through Medicare, Medicaid, the Veterans Affairs, CHIP program, and other programs. So in November of 2015, alarmed by these price increases, as chairman of the Senate Aging Committee, along with then-ranking member Claire McCaskill, I launched an extensive bipartisan investigation into the extreme spikes that we were seeing in drugs that had been off patent. In other words, their patent had expired, and yet they did not have a generic equivalent. The drugs that we examined ranged from nitropress, which is used to treat dangerous cardiac conditions, and is often found as a standard drug on hospital crash carts, to drugs used to treat rare genetic diseases, severe infections such as tuberculosis, and other life-threatening conditions. The findings of our investigation were troubling, to say the least. At our first hearing in December of 2015, we centered on four companies that had acquired decades-old, off-patent, affordable drugs, and then raised their prices suddenly and astronomically so that they were no longer affordable. I remember that one of the drugs had first been uh, entered the marketplace the year after I had been born. In it was in 1953 that it first became available. It had been off patent for many, many years and stably priced for many, many years. The investigation uncovered a monopoly business model that used that these companies use for selecting life-saving prescription drugs. For example, the price of a valiant drug that is used to treat Wilson's disease, a rare genetic disorder that is fatal if left untreated, increased from $652 per month to more than $21,000 per month. That's a more than a 3,000% increase in price with no justification. Our committee staff interviewed hundreds of patients, doctors, hospital administrators, other healthcare providers, consumer advocates, academic experts, and pharmaceutical industry executives and their board members. We reviewed more than a million pages of documents, many of which we subpoenaed, obtained from these four companies, and we deposed or took transcribed interviews of 10 corporate witnesses. We held three public hearings and issued our report with our findings and recommendations. Regrettably, we issued that report in December of an election year, and it really didn't get the attention that it deserved, but its findings and recommendations remain valid and remain a source that we are working on. One of Pew's state line articles on drug pricing featured a photograph of Martin Shkreli. That was taken uh, during his testimony before Congress. His truly is the face of this egregious business practice. As he formally headed two of the companies we examined, Turing and Retrovin. Today, Mr. Shkreli won't be found at any fancy corporate headquarters but instead among the inmate population at the Fort Dix Federal Prison where he's serving seven years for securities fraud. But I was struck by an interview that he gave in which he was asked, 
well, why did you raise the prices of these drugs so exorbitantly? And he answered simply, because I could. The committee discovered that each of the four companies that we closely examined followed a business model that gave them de facto monopoly pricing power, enabling them to impose and protect astronomical price increases. The business model consists of five central elements. First, the companies would look for a sole source drug for which there was only one manufacturer and therefore would face no immediate competition, maintaining complete power over its pricing. Second, the company would ensure that the drug was considered the gold standard, the best drug available for the condition that it treats. Third, the company would select a drug that serves a small patient market. And this was because they figured that these patients would not be able to organize effective opposition. They also calculated that if the patient pool were small, it was unlikely to be that attractive to generic competitors. And that gave the companies more latitude to hike their prices. Fourth, the company would control access to the drug through a closed distribution system, a specialty pharmacy or some other means, making it more difficult for competitors to obtain a sufficient amount of the drug to do the bioequivalency tests that the FDA requires to enter the market. And finally, then the company would price gouge, maximizing profits by jacking up the prices as high as possible. Now, I want to stress that each of the drugs that we investigated had been off patent for decades. And here's another really important fact. None of the four acquiring companies had invested a single penny in the research and development of these drugs. Furthermore, the committee found that they were doing nothing to significantly improve the drugs that would justify the exorbitant price increase. There were no increases in production or distribution costs that would justify the cost increases. Here are just a few examples of the business model in action. Turing, which at one point was run by Martin Shkreli, raised the price of Daraprim, the gold standard for toxoplasmosis from $13.50 a pill to $750, literally overnight. Then they put the drug in a closed distribution system. Now, these closed distribution systems, one example of which is the REM system, is intended for drugs that have serious side effects. So you want to make really sure that the distribution is carefully controlled. It is not intended to prevent a generic drug company or some other competitor from buying up enough of the drug to do those bioequivalency uh, tests that I mentioned earlier. Here's another example. Retrofin raised the drug price uh, that is the preferred therapy for a rare chronic genetic kidney disease from $1.50 a tablet to $30 per tablet and once again instituted a closed distribution system. I could go on and on. Let me give you one more example. 
Rodalis raised the price of a drug that is the gold standard for a multi-drug resistant kind of tuberculosis from $500 for 30 capsules to $10,800 for those same 30 capsules. I don't know how these companies can live with themselves, I must say. Valiant, the largest of the companies that we investigated, presented the most complex case. This company spiked the price of not one off-patent gold standard drug, but four. It raised the price of two hospital drugs that are life-saving in emergency cases of cardiac arrest. The business model employed by these four companies was also actively supported and promoted by investors on their boards. All four companies had close relationships with activist investors who were intimately involved in the direction of the companies. We got a lot of emails that were back and forth. In the case of Retrofin, internal emails revealed how an investor outlined the business model to then CEO Martin Shkreli, writing, quote, funny that these small companies still haven't realized that you can raise the price aggressively and nobody gets too upset. This dynamic may not last forever, you need to maximize the opportunities while you can. Well, sudden price spikes in decades-old drugs have devastated patients and families throughout our nation. Dozens of people called the company to share their personal stories. People have been forced to go without vital medicine or to use less effective drugs. People are skipping doses or hoarding pills out of fear that their next refill will not arrive or will be unaffordable. Poignantly, patients reported the anxiety they felt as they watched the prices climb and felt so helpless to do anything about it. Hospitals, too, have been forced to make extensive changes while simultaneously facing great uncertainties and suffering budget repercussions. As much as $12 million per year more for one hospital system for those crash cart drugs that I mentioned. In an effort to reduce costs, hospitals have taken aggressive steps to reduce their usage of these drugs, even though they may be the most effective means of treating a patient. The increased time that administrators, physicians, nurses, and others who treat patients spend in developing policies and learning and implementing new protocols is time away from direct patient care. Hospitals even reported to us having to hire new full-time employees just to assist patients with administrative processes of being able to obtain medicines in the face of soaring costs. So what we started to see were rural hospitals, which were already barely hanging on, being really hurt by these drug cost increases. Our investigative work continues today. One hearing earlier this year was on rheumatoid arthritis drugs, and it revealed that medicines developed decades ago to provide relief from that painful condition have doubled in price since 2012. A hearing that we held in May on the cost of insulin provided the very definition of irony. When a team of three scientists at the University of Toronto discovered insulin in 1921, they revolutionized the treatment for diabetes, transforming it from a debilitating and fatal disease 
to a manageable chronic condition. These scientists sold the patent for $1 each to the university, a move intended to ensure that those in need would always have affordable access. They explicitly stated that that was their purpose. Their admirable intentions have been betrayed. The price for a vial of Humalog, for example, increased from $35 in 2001 to 234 in 2015 to $275 in 2017. We had a father with a son with type, type 1 diabetes testify at our hearing how frantic he was to find affordable insulin for his son. He finally found that the best way for him to get it was from Canada. He lives in Maine, so he could get it from Canada. He should not have to do that. And I'm really worried, given the escalation of the cost, uh, that we can't figure out why or get a good explanation. There have been some modifications in different kinds of insulin. Some acts more quickly, some acts more slowly. But insulin's been around since 1921. The cost increase may be due, in fact, from a practice called evergreening. And that is when pharmaceutical companies obtain new patents for drugs based on small innovations, the result of which is to extend a market monopoly on the drug beyond the initial patent's expiration. Although the small changes may make a tremendous difference for some patients, the improvements may not be worth the additional cost for some. But you know what it's like. We always want the newest, the best, the what is the new thing on the market, even if it may not really be worth the additional cost. For insulin, a careful look is warranted to determine if the modifications were used just to extend the patent protections and discourage competitors. And this brings me to the important question of what can Congress do about this? Following our initial investigation, I co-authored a bipartisan bill with Senator McCaskill to promote generic competition to help lower the cost of prescription drugs. Our goal is to help foster a more competitive marketplace. And it was signed into law last year as part of an FDA reform bill. As a result of our new law, FDA is taking action and last month published an updated list of off-patent drugs that do not have an approved generic. That's a welcome dose of sunshine because it helps the competitor figure out which drugs Patents have expired. That was required by our law. FDA also established a competitive generic therapy program, an incentive to create more competition for applicants for which there is more, there is no more than one approved generic. Because what we found is you generally see the price drop when there are two generics on the market, not not just one. And we're beginning to see progress. Since June of 2017, FDA has approved generics for 11 drugs that were formerly sole sourced. And just last month, FDA reported that there were 16 designated abbreviated new drug applications awaiting FDA action at the end of March. And that's an increase from three awaiting action at the end of December 2017. But more remains to be done. The HELP Committee, is uh, the Senate Health, Education, Labor, and Pensions Committee, is also delving into this issue. 
At a help committee hearing last fall, I focused on the role of pharmacy benefit managers, also known as PBMs. After hearing from pharmacists in Maine, I learned that some contracts between PBMs and pharmacies actually contain so-called gag clauses that prohibit pharmacists from telling consumers if they, their prescription would cost less if they paid for it out of pocket rather than using their insurance. But they can only answer that question if the consumer asks. Well, it's so counterintuitive to think that paying out of pocket is going to be cheaper than using your insurance. Using your debit card is going to save you money over using your insurance card. Who's going to think to ask that? So I was outraged when I learned about this pro process. And I was so grateful to these pharmacists from Maine uh, for coming to me and telling me about it. I have to ask a basic question as well, and that is, how can it be that an insurance company's prescription benefit manager, whose very job it is to negotiate lower prices, drug prices, could instead be leading consumers to pay more for a drug than they otherwise would have to. Now, due to the publicity, a lot of PBMs have dropped these. And Seema Verma, the head of CMS, has also sent out a letter saying that they are no longer acceptable. But we want this to be law. And we've introduced two bills, one that will go to finance and apply to Medicare and Medicaid programs, one to the HELP Committee that will apply to private to the Affordable Care Act programs, to ERISA programs, private health care programs, to make sure uh, that this pernicious practice is ended once and for all. A common thread in all of our investigations and hearings is a lack of transparency in the pharmaceutical system. What we have noticed is that price varies on a number of factors. It includes the list price set by the manufacturer, the fees charged by distributors, wholesalers, and other middlemen such as the PBMs. And a lot of times the negotiated price is not passed on to the consumer. Sometimes it's used to lower premiums. That may be a good thing in some cases. But a lot of times, the consumer is not seeing the result of, of the impact of those negotiations. We also found that these overlapping relationships have created a system that's rife with conflicts of interest and perverse incentives. For example, if you're a PBM and you're controlling which drugs are listed on an insurer's formulary, the manufacturer has a perverse incentive to have a higher list price because then the PBM, who's often paid on a percentage basis, is going to get more for its work and the manufacturer wants that drug included on the formulary. So it seems to me there's an inbuilt conflict of interest right there, although, to be fair, we're still investigating this. When we did our hearing on insulin, the American Diabetes Association, which had spent a great deal of time studying the cost of insulin and why it had increased, gave us a chart, and it is unbelievably complex. And when we asked them to explain it, they essentially threw up their hands, despite the extraordinary research that they have done. That's how opaque uh, the system is. Healthcare 
is complex enough for consumers to navigate without the added confusion of a drug system that is so opaque. I will say that I have raised these issues at hearings and in conversations with the FDA Commissioner Scott Gottlieb, and I am very impressed with him. He agrees that the current system is too complex, it is opaque, and at times it seems to be designed to benefit everyone except the patient. The, co the commissioner is especially passionate about redesigning the rebate structure to ensure that savings are passed on to those who need them most, patients and their families. He's announced that the FDA will expedite generic entry for cases with the limited competition, and he has stated his commitment to increasing competition overall, which is very encouraging. I'm also encouraged that in Congress, at a time when bipartisanship seems like an increasingly rare commodity, that this is an issue that can bring us together. While the lion's share of work remains to be done, the multitude of hearings, letters, bills, and milestones so far demonstrate a pattern of working together and across the aisle to help reduce the cost of prescription drugs. If we want new medicines to reach consumers who need them, the companies that invest in R&D must see a fair return on their investment, and I recognize that. At the same time, we cannot allow price manipulation to continue at the expense of some of the most vulnerable Americans and their families and ultimately at the expense of the American taxpayer. The required policy solutions won't come in the form of a miracle, but with hard work to better understand precisely what is happening and continued bipartisan cooperation. I want to thank you for being part of this effort and it's something that matters greatly to me. We're going to continue working on it in the Aging Committee and in the Health Committee and try to continue to work on solutions to a very complex problem. Thanks for joining us. If you'd like to learn more about rising drug prices or Pew's work on this issue, visit our website at pewtrust.org slash after the fact. And if you like what you hear, help us out by leaving a review on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Stitcher, or wherever you listen. And if you haven't already, make sure you subscribe so you can receive our latest episodes on your mobile device. For the Pew Charitable Trusts, I'm Dan LaDuke, and this is after the fact. <laughs>